Hello. Hello. How's your con so far? I can see lots of, you're doing lots of signing down there. I know that. So it's looking fantastic, yeah? It's great. This is a big con. It's great that, you know, it's so busy and people are kind of like, there's so, so many guests here. It's, it's a good yeah. place to be at. No, it's brilliant. So, Jordan, Clive, we, we've spoken before and yeah. I honestly love the interview. You know, I'm a, uh, a massive Vikings fan. Lucy, it's the first time uh, yeah. I've got to interview. I'm terribly <laughs> excited today. This is great. Um, I just want, you know, you, you are a, a star, aren't you? All, you know, like playing piano, all singing, all dancing, fantastic theatrical background as well. And I wanted to know how, you know, did you have any theatrical training which helped you put Ingrid onto, onto screen? Um, so I, I did, I, I trained at a school called Tring Park uh, in Hertfordshire for a few years. Um, uh, yeah, and then I, start, I actually started working at 17 in a show called Dirty Dancing in London. Um, so I, I did have some tra training, but I, I started to work young, so I think I learnt on the job <laughs> a lot of it. Yeah. Did you have a, you know, like I've, I've done a little bit of theatre work, but did you do any other, did you do any other sword work or anything like that? Any, were there any skills that you learned that you could bring to, to the show? Yeah, we did stage combat, um, mm. but obviously as a, because uh, I was a professional dancer as well, uh, a lot of it is like choreography, so it's quite easy for me to pick it up, you know, because it's just, it's movement, but not like this one, this is a... Well, 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 no, exactly. I was going to say, you know, this one here, you know, gold medalist in fencing and uh, uh, and Muay Thai champion. I mean, the list goes on, it goes on, it goes on. Um, but, I mean, it's still going to be different, isn't it? You're still, you know, you're an expert fencer, great, but that doesn't mean you're going to be great with a, a Viking sword. Well, that's the thing. I mean, this is what I have to put this right in, any, in Wales anyway. It says on Wikipedia that I'm a gold medalist fencer. It's not true. I was taught. I was lie. taught fencing. I, that was a lie. I was I taught like, oh, fencing by a gold medalist fencer. Uh, but what I did do when I was 14 years old, my parents didn't really care where I was. I was like this feral child that was working in a stunt group in Sherwood Forest, um, jousting. So I was 14, getting put on the back of a horse. I didn't have a horse ride at the time, and they were like, "Just hold on to this lance." <laughs> squeeze, squeeze your hips in, and let's hold on for dear life. And they just smack the horse, and I'd be like, ah. I was learning to, yeah. So I was jousting, I was sword fighting, axe, ball, and chain. Um, and this was, this is not a professional sword fighting team as well. This is a sword That's fighting very team. Very different, they, different they'd from make an their Olympic own armor. gold medal. <laughs> 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 no, but I did um, when I went to drama school. I learned, um, I did the stage combat course, but I, I got taught by an Olympic gold medalist, Rodney Cotier, his name was, um, and I got to do the advanced gold certificate in stage combat with distinction, which is you have to, most actors at drama school, you learn one fight. So you might do a fencing fight or you might do, you have to do five different fights in five different disciplines. So, and I got a distinction in that. So that was the one thing I could do. The acting kind of <laughs> wasn't so good, at, but, but I could beat you up with a sword. <laughs> Nobody said a thing. No, no, no. Um, John, what about yourself? So I know we, we chatted about this before, but you know, how, much, uh, how much experience do you have before? You've lots of TV before and whatnot. But again, you know, how, how much of the, the combat-ready sort of uh, skill set did you have to bring uh, to, to you know, Well, I was set? actually an Olympic bobsledder. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the Scottish and Australian team. Um, and we loved you in Cool Running. It was amazing. Uh, yeah. It was great. It was good. It was one of my best. Um, I mean, I just had a basic background in like boxing and fitness and just general movement. I think the stunt team we've got on Vikings, the way they train you, you can literally know nothing and you can start. The hardest part about it is anyone can learn a routine, but then you've got to put a character behind it in a story. And I think that's the part that I enjoyed kind of the most at the whole thing. So once you can put your flair on it, it drives them nuts because they want you to do it a certain way. But once you do it, then it becomes a character, it becomes cool, and it's much more fun to do it that way. So I think that's kind of the, the mental part was the hardest part. Absolutely. And, you know, when I, I watched the show religiously, my, my girlfriend as well is an absolute fanatic, so it was, it was great. When it, it is one of the, the shows that sort of translated, you know, my girlfriend's not a big fan of sci-fi, yet she would sit there and she would watch Vikings. It was great. Um, it was just an amazing program. And I'm watching you all. You, you totally sold us. And... Just watching the fight scenes, I mean, they were brutal. You know, I'm including you, Lucy. You, know, you were a formidable shield maiden. You know, it was literally these these fantastic fight scenes. And I, I just want to know how much, how much of that was you? How much of it was were the, were the stunt doubles? Were you going for it? Was that you know, 
help us help us to experience what you guys went through. Lisa, I'd like to start with you. <laughs> well, no, I didn't have a stunt stunt double. Um, I, I didn't do I didn't do loads of fighting. I did a lot of archery. I did a few bits, but yeah, no, I didn't have one. So um, so yeah, but I, I, most of us didn't have one. Did you have one? It wasn't really there. I mean, we had two great stunt coordinators, Franklin Henson and Richard Ryan. And they, they set it up by, they, they didn't need any stunt doubles. Because we, had, we, we, block sh we would block shoot, so we would film three episodes at the same time. And what generally would happen is, because you've got that much advanced prep, you would film all the boat stuff together, all the battle stuff together, and then all of the acting scenes together. So they would usually lump the, the battle scenes into the end of the block. So you would have two or three weeks to rehearse, which what it meant was that you would rehearse with the stunt guys to the point where you would know the routine really well in a concrete hangar, but then they'd be like, whatever happens on the day, just keep going. So the problem with filming an island is that it'd be raining for weeks on end, and by the time you actually got out into the fields, you were slipping and sliding in the mud. But when you've got 100 people running behind you, you know, doing the same kind of stuff, you can't really be that actor just messing up a, you know, a, a move and just going, oh, cut, cut, I messed it up. It's like, just carry on. So a lot of the time, something you learn on your feet, you might slip over and then the same choreography would be on your knees, you'd get smacked in the face and things. A lot of, a lot of the mistakes would end up on screen, but that's what I think made our show a little bit more visceral and a little bit more you know, rough around the edges and real because as Jordan was hitting on, there's a difference between acting and stunts that you know, in acting you have to be completely in the moment and you respond on what you get in that moment from the other actor. Whereas in stunts, if you do it like that, you get smacked in the face with a sword. So you have to be two beats ahead of yourself. You know, this move comes here, and then, then my brother's in trouble. I notice my brother, and then the sword comes in at the last minute, and I block it. So you know it's going to happen, but you've got you've to be on top of that. So what ha often happens is things go wrong, and you, you, know, you end up just using it. So a lot of, I mean, for instance, there's one scene where uh, Ragnar, Travis, is, is running down the shield wall screaming orders, and one of the stunt guys gets through the shield wall, it wasn't meant to happen, and knocks him flat on his ass. And Travis gets smacked on the ground, and he just carries on, and he just kills this guy, and he yeah, quite brutally, it wasn't choreographed, gets up, carries on his speech, and it's in, it makes the cut. And that's what I think makes our show more special than some of these, these shows where it's so choreographed within an inch of its life. But, I, I, you know, to me, it, it, it's got to be like that. You know, if you've got, it, you can see the audience we got here, you guys had bigger bigger fight scenes and the you know huge thousands of people coming in and and you know you can't just say oh, sorry cut everyone sorry I slipped sorry about that you've just got to keep going the funny thing was though that sometimes they do that with the extras the the, the assistant directors would would scream out to all the extras and be like like whatever you do when you've killed your guy just find someone else and kill them just keep going because someone else might still be acting over here so sometimes the extras would kill their guy and they would just run around the battlefield and they'd find like Lucy or me or Jordan and start just trying to stab us. And you're sitting there in the middle of your hero fight just going, you can't kill me, I'm Rollo. <laughs> <laughs> elbow them in the face. Get them in the so any of those mistakes, were there any, um, any injuries at all? There's got to be injuries. Mm, I punched a girl in the face by mistake. That wasn't good fun. <laughs> Purposely, or? <laughs> it was exactly what Clive said. It's one of these chaotic, rainy days. And we had practiced this so much. And we had, like, I had five people to kill. I was having way too good of a time. And I knew she was supposed to go left and I was supposed to go right. And I went the wrong way and just cracked her square between the eyes. Like, and I saw the look on her face. She's like, I hate you. <laughs> and her eyes started to go a little bit funny. And I was like, of all the people I had to be fighting, it was this lovely young Irish girl. And I just cracked her square between the eyes. But yeah, accidents happen a lot. It's just the chaoticness. Like, I know it's supposed to be rehearsed. It's very safe. They do a good job. But when you put 300 people versus 300 people and horses and catapults and fires and there's people with blood guns going off, like it's the funnest day you'll ever have in your life. But it is chaos. Yeah. I got four or five stitches in my, uh, in my shoulder from a metal spear that went into my... It was my fault. But... Um, <laughs> We were, we were, it was, it was when Rollo was defending Kattegat, when Ragnar and everyone are away, and I've got all the old men and the women and the children, and Jarlborg's coming at me, and one of his men, it was a fight with uh, Connor Hegarty, um, one of the stunt guys, and he comes at me with, with, with metal spears, but so for a lot of the close-ups, they tried to take the metal spears out and use the rubber tips, and there's this one bit where they wanted me to block it at the last minute, and the spear comes in like this, and the director's like, it looks like rubber. We can't use the rubber one for this. We, can, are we all right using the metal one? I'm like, yeah, fine, use the metal one. It's fine, I'll be there. 
What could possibly go yeah, wrong? Yeah, what can possibly go wrong? The metal spear comes in. My sword doesn't quite come up in time. It stabs me right here. Everyone kind of sees it. I felt it, but I didn't, you know, but, but I've got, you know, my costume on. And, and I remember they're like, oh, do you want to see the medic? I'm like, no, it's fine. Did we get the shot? And they're like, well, we need to do another one. We did two more. And then the makeup artist, Tom McInerney, as I had a makeup, was looking at me. He's just pointing at me going, I think you need to... Uh, and I'm looking down, and the blood has started pouring down my costume, and it's trickling off my, off my, my fingers. And I'm like, oh. And then we open it up, and it's spurting out blood. <laughs> and then I was taken to the hospital, and I think I had five... Four, four, it might have been four stitches. I tend to exaggerate. <laughs> four stitches. So it's two. <laughs> yes, two. <laughs> two little... It was a scratch. <laughs> So you know when we're all watching this going, God, that looks so realistic. It probably was. That's, uh, that's why it was. And guys, I know we've only literally got you the half an hour here. I, I, I would talk to you all uh, until this evening. Um, but I really want to put, uh, you know, allow the audience to get some questions in as well. If you've got any questions for the panel, uh, please put your hands up. with some down here straight away, look. Uh, and we've got a Roman mic just on the way around. Um, there we go. Hi, it's along the same lines as what um, everyone else has kind of been saying, talking about fight scenes, stuff like that. Um, me and my partner watch Vikings a lot, unless you haven't noticed. Um, and we were talking about watching you guys infiltrate Paris and stuff like that. And I was wondering, for all of you, you all must have like a specific scene or a specific um, episode that was really hard on you physically and mentally to, um, to learn. And I was just wondering which was the hardest um, kind of fight scene or scene for you to film. Um, I had a one-on-one -on -one battle in season six and it was to get the land that I wanted. And that battle took, it was fighting with Frodo, that took about six to eight weeks to rehearse. And it was constant. It was like four or five days up at the sunset going on. The guy I was working with, um, he was amazing. He was really good. It was a guy called Lee McDermott. Started the whole thing for us, a Scottish guy. I like him a lot. Um, and he worked out the whole plan. And again, it was about selling the story. So everyone wants to look like a hero and go and fight and look amazing. But you've got to, there's got to be stakes always. So if you think someone's going to die, if you get the near hit, you've got to learn how to take a hit and do it. And that was the hardest for me just because it was so long. It took two and a half days to film. It was the first time I've ever taken pre-workout for a fight scene. I was just so wrecked and tired. I was like out of my mind on pre-workout doing this fight scene just to keep myself going over and over and over. You start with a wide shot and you do different shots, but that one was definitely the most taxing on me for sure. And at the end of it, I was very proud of it. I think I thought it looked good. So I hope you did too. <laughs> I said the most. I, I, I was, the, the, the fight I did with Bjorn, when he has to knock me out to stop me from getting killed, that was probably the most taxing as an actor because there was so many emotions going on it. But because you brought up the siege on Paris, was, I've just got a funnier story. Um, <laughs> I remember the bit when, where I see uh, Princess Gisela for the first time and, and they push the siege tower and I fall off the battlements into the moat and you think I'm dead. Well, they came up to me and they were like, do you want to do this stunt yourself? And I'm like, yeah, of course I do, of course I do. And it's basically, they've, they've built a moat. It's in the studio. They've built a moat, but there's only, there's a nine foot deep part of the moat and the rest of it's only about four feet deep. So there's only a specific kind of, you know, box that you can land in in the water and be safe. So that's terrifying me. Um, and then they're going, right, well, we want you to, so they've got this, this, they've got this crane above me and they want me to fight and I've got my top off and I'm fighting with these guys and at the last minute they're like, when we say now, we just want you to throw yourself back and the crane is going to follow you down and we're going to do this slow motion shot of you going, ah, falling into the water and splash. So I do that and I'm like fighting, fighting, they're here now and I just go, whoa, for a throw myself back and you do have that you know, 1,000, 2,000, you're like, where's the water? And then slam, it smacked my back and it's like, you know, backward belly flop. And they wanted me to stay under the water as well so it appeared that Rollo was dead. So I'm holding my breath and I can see all the lights and things and I see this big shadow, which is Franklin Henson, who's our big stunt coordinator. And I can see him and I'm like, we got the shot. So I'm coming up and he looks like he's going to grab my hand and he's like, you got another one in you? So what had happened is apparently I'd flung myself off too far back and the camera had come down and all they'd got is a big close-up of my crotch. <laughs> and they watch it back and it's just this. So they're like, well, this time 
we want you to just, we need to get this shot because obviously they have to dry me off and we have to do it again. All the extras go. So it's, they're, they're quite angry. Um, and then, so they say, this time we're going to do like what you do, the trust exercises. They say, we're not going to do the fight and we've already got that bit. We're just going to have you on the battlements. I've got no harness or anything like that. We're, we're at the top of, you know, it's about the, 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 the length of this ceiling here. And I've got my toes off the edge of it. And they say, when we say action, we just want you to do this and fall back. And then obviously the, the, you'll be in the right position for the camera to follow you down. It's terrifying because not only have I felt what it feels like to smack my back on the water now, and we're doing it again, and I'm actually just, it's like, you know, it's like bungee jumping backwards, I suppose, without a rope. That was terrifying. But yeah, we got it, and it was amazing, and I'm glad I did it. But yeah, you don't think you expect those kind of things. I think the clue was when they said, Clive, do you want someone, are you doing this yourself, or would you like a stunt person to do this? I see, the truth you? is, the truth is, I remember the producers came down. Because um, the, the, the stunt guys were great with us, and they really did trust us. But I remember the producers came down, they're like, Clive's not doing that, is he? And then Franklin was like, no, no, we got Jonathan to do it. Jonathan's going to do it. And I'm like, and, I'm, you know, and he's like, like looking at me going, shut up, Clive. Because I'm like, I want to do it. And as the producers walk away, they're like, Clive, get up there. <laughs> Lucy, what about you? Um, well, physically, I think, I think the most physical thing that I had to do really was probably the scene... I'm actually prancing around Bjorn's tomb. That I spent like a few days doing that and filming that whole scene. Um, and it was actually improvised. But it sounds silly, but when you're prancing around for hours <laughs> and hours during the day, I think that was probably like the most exhausting thing physically that I had to do. Um, and mentally, probably, like emotionally, I, I think with my character, she... She had such like an emotional arc because so many things happened to her. She put herself in the situation, but so many things happened to her. Um, and the scene with Harold was emotionally very draining. Um, and there was quite a lot of scenes with her that she was afraid. And that, is, that emotion is particularly exhausting to play, to actually create fear within yourself and portray that properly. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would get to the end of the day and just be like, just like emotionally drained, and I would just sit there in silence like this, and I'd be like, "You okay?" I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> There's just like nothing going on. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. How much of Bjorn's tomb was was there? Was that was was some of it CGI? Was it all built? Yeah, it was completely built in the studio. So you've got this, you've got this dome that they'd built. Um, and there were cameras, and there were holes in. They'd created holes in the in the building, in the structure that they'd built. Um, and and sometimes there was like some some of the camera guys would actually come in and move around with me. But because it was improvised, you know, they didn't actually know what I was going to do next. <laughs> so I was kind of having to dance around them as well. Um, yeah, it was actually pretty complex, but it was, it was so much fun as a dancer as well. I really got to enjoy myself there. Um, yeah, it was weird, and I loved it. <laughs> Amazing. Let's get another question in. Oh, hello at the back. Hi there. Um, I'm up here. <laughs> hello. I can see you. Um, I really enjoy the show. It's a, it's a really fantastic, immersive world that has been created, and one of the things I really like is the accents that are part of it. I think that that's a big part of what helps create that world. Um, what I was wondering is how much time is spent getting those right and how difficult it was. I'm not sure we got it right. <laughs> <laughs> For me, when I first started, I hadn't actually seen the show when I first went in to see about it. So I watched a show called The Dudesons, which is this ridiculous show that I remember from when I was younger. About what? It's called The Dudesons. It's like, a, I think the Finnish show about these guys that do pranks. And I was like, they have an accent that sounds legit. And I just went way too far with it. I sounded like I'd been living there for 20 years. And then I was like, maybe just watch the show. And the guys that have been doing it for the last five years, that would be the smartest idea to do it. But we had um, a great accent coach, a guy called Paul, an Irish fellow who was really, really good. And he would sit down with you. And I think once you get like two or three key words and you start practicing it and you get it in your head and it starts to flow, and also everyone on set's talking the same way, so you start to get into this flow. And I think within Vikings too, we really created our own accent. It really became the Viking accent because we've got people from England, America, Denmark, Sweden, Australia, 
and it just became this accent that we created within ourselves that was part of our world and I think it worked. Yeah. Well we had a we had a dialect coach. So when I joined obviously it was season six, so it'd really been developed. So there was a definite um certain vowels with like those exact sounds that you had to follow. Um, and I remember writing it all down and being like, I have no idea how I'm going to get this. Like, it, was, it seemed impossible. But um, luckily, um, uh, Raga, the, the actress who played Gunhild, she is Icelandic and she nailed it. And I remember the dialect coach just saying to me, if you ever have any questions, just ask her. And I, most of my scenes were with her. So I just, yeah, I had like a great person on set to be around. <laughs> I've got nothing to add. <laughs> no problem. Let's go, we've, we've got time probably for another two questions, I think. Hi again. Um, if you didn't play the characters that you did, who would you like to have played and why? Lagatha. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'd win my Emmy. <laughs> no, actually, in all seriousness, I think she's the most well-written character in the whole show. I mean, she's the linchpin of everything. Ragnar's fun, but Lagatha is, is a pretty amazing character. But I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't play anyone else. I, I remember I did nine auditions to play Ragnar. Um, and Rollo was originally written to be Ragnar's 50-year-old cousin. Um, so I, I, mean, I love the fact that Michael, Michael got in touch and was like, we're going to change the role to a brother. And we think the dynamic of this being a similar age and that jealousy would work way better than the cousin and you know, this. And they obviously, the 50-year-old cousin was a little bit like Asterix and Obelix. You know, just having this big kind of cousin, this kind of big burly cousin. And, um, but what I loved is when I, I, you know, I did, I, I wanted to play Ragnar. I had nine auditions to play it. So when I turned up and Travis had the role, there was this automatic, and I'm like, oh, God, this, he's getting the role I wanted. And, you know, um, but there was something that Travis, from day one, played Ragnar like he wanted him to be the villain. And I was always going to play Ragnar like he was the hero. And he was the right guy to play the role. And what I was able to do is to play Rollo as the villain who wanted to be the hero. And I think that dynamic between Ragnar and Rollo is what really made the brother thing work. And it was, it was just something that had happened on day one. I was like, I saw what he was doing with it, and he's been this mercurial kind of, and I was like, this is great. Because the best thing to do is do the complete opposite. And I suddenly found myself going, this guy just wants to be loved so much. He's, you know, he's doing these things because he just wants his recognition. And I think that, you know, I actually, I wouldn't play any other character than Rollo now. Oh. I would play the seer. 100%. I think a seer origin stories would be unbelievable. Working with him, scenes with him, I think it just encaptures the whole Viking world. I find that character fascinating. I'd love to see him as a 19-year-old boy to see what how the seer became the seer. I would dive into that in a heartbeat. I love that character. He also has like a hand-licking fetish. Yeah, I do like licking him. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Amazing. Uh. <laughs> we can fit one last question in. Okay. Hi, guys. It was just a quick Hello. one in regards to each of your characters. Do you feel like you got the endings that you actually deserved? Obviously, for yourself, Rolo, obviously going over to France, you know, becoming like a high lord, Ingrid. You obviously went on to rule Kataka. You know, it's a big move. And then Ube, you obviously uh, fulfilled Ragnar's dream. Do you feel like that's the ending that you wanted? Or do you feel like you could have had more or done more? Um, I was pretty happy with my ending. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, yeah, I was surprised that I, that was even that that I, when I read the script, I was surprised that that was even the case. I wasn't expecting it at all. Um, I was originally uh, contracted for eight episodes and uh, obviously ended up doing eighteen. So um, for me, I was yeah, I was it was a yeah, it was a big moment for Ingrid. <laughs> you won Vikings. That's pretty much it. You just ended up being the only person left alive. From slave to queen is not bad, really, is it? Yeah, it's not bad, no. <laughs> Killed some people. Had a good time. I, well, I, I, um, well, I never... I mean, I, I really... I mean, Rollo was... Um, that's, how, that's what happened in history. I mean, I feel a bit hard done by it. It was my own fault. I did another TV show, and I was meant to come back for, I think, eight, eight to nine episodes in that season, and I only managed to come back for two because... The, nasty Canadians wouldn't release me from a contract. Um, but what we did want to do is, I mean, this is a nice little tidbit that you see, obviously the last time you see Rollo, he comes in and he, and he gives a lot of troops to Ivar the Boneless, and Ivar gives him a whole boatload of, of, of gold. 
that's what we spoke about. And originally, me and um, Michael Hurst talked about, because the way that Rollo died in the history books is that apparently on his death day, he got 100 Christians out in the, in the court in Rouen and had them sacrificed. And then he sent 100 pounds in weight of gold to the church. So this man, even at the end of his life, was hedging his bets whether he was going to go to Valhalla or heaven. He was like, I'll give 100 pounds of gold to the church, but yeah, I'll kill all these Christians just to kind of appease Odin. So what we wanted to do is have, when Rollo was going back with his soldiers, he was going to kill all the soldiers on the boat and then give all the gold that Ivor gave him to, you know, to the Charles and the, and the, and the king and, of France and, and to the church, which would have kind of almost appeased that storyline, which I never get to show on screen. So I wish we got to see that, but um, I'm really happy with, with the show and it's the best show I've ever been a part of. Um, I mean, I was in the final scene when it ended. Um, when I first read that, I was kind of confused by it, but I think the way the character was going at the time, it was a time of like finding the new land, finding this thing, like what's next for the Vikings, where do you go? And I felt that inside me. And when I read that Uber would be sitting with Floki on that beach, um, that's one of the most magical scenes I've ever shot in my life. And to get spiritual about it, it was nuts. Um, we watched the sunrise, we're in this beautiful beach in Ireland. And as part of the Viking crew, there's hundreds of people. So there couldn't be any like footprints on the sand. So what they did is they sat me and Gustav on the water's edge. They then spent hours cleaning it back and then everyone just stopped in silence and watched the sunrise. So you've literally got a thousand people sitting there who have worked together for 12 years, watching the sunrise come up and it's going through you. And I'm sitting there with this amazing actor and I was like, this is the greatest experience I'll ever have probably in my acting career. Like I was like, this is just surreal. And for the show to end that way, I turned around and there's 700 grown Irish men with tears in their eyes being like, this is the end of an era. And it just blew my mind. So I'll never forget that. And then we left like two days later. So I loved that ending. Yeah, I thought it was beautiful. But you know, there were a lot more people with tears in their eyes sat at home as well. You guys asked a lot of us, you asked us to buy in to people that have been dead for 1,600 years and you completely sold us. It was just one of the best programs I've ever watched on TV. And I'm not just saying that because you sat here um, and I think I'd have lots of people nodding in the audience as well. We all love you. We love you here at Wales Comic Con. Let's show that love now. Say a massive round of applause, please, right. to Lucy, Clive, and Jordan. Thank you.